Hello, Government Seekers. My name is Graham Elwood. You were watching Government Secrets. Um, Lee, I put this in the private chat. Uh, just type something so I can make a moderator. Uh, I need I need to see it, and then I can just click on your thing and make a moderator. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, on both Lee and myself, our YouTube channels. Um, are you kooky 57, Lee? Because <laughs> uh, I'm not seeing it show up. Unless it's showing up on your... So you need to log in to my, watch on my YouTube show type something in the chat and then I can make you a moderator on, on my YouTube show. That's how we need to do it. Um, all right, just bring me and don't worry about it. Okay, cool. Um, all right, everybody, ever watching on Rockfin, like, share, subscribe. And we will be going live immediately following today's show on our Patreon, which you can see it below, patreon.com slash government secrets. There it is. Boom. Okay. There we go. Hello, Holly. Our, uh, so Holly and Blaze Saver Wolf, our moderators. And let us get right into it. Like, hit the like button, share this out on your social media. And here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Government Secrets Episode 111 with the two most censored comedians in the world, Lee Camp and Grab Bellwood. Boom. <laughs> Hey, man. <laughs> How you doing? I'm good, buddy. How are you? Not bad. Not bad. Uh, I, yeah, I think so. I think you just made me a moderator on your YouTube page. But I think yes, I, uh, I think if you invite via stream, you know, we can do it next time. Then I can be a overall moderator. But it, it's not a big deal. OK, maybe there's a way through. I don't know how to do it through StreamYard. I didn't know such a thing existed, but. They're there. You know what? They're always coming up with something new, man. Isn't that the case? Like, I can green screen this, my old, my background from my monitor, but now it does this weird thing where I just got a haircut. So it like erases part of my head and makes my head more narrow. You should have told your barber, don't make my haircut green screen um, uh, uh, melty. <laughs> I think I figured it out. Because the wall behind me is gray. So StreamYard is just taking uh, it. And the gray in my hair is yeah, is melting in. So in, in, in case you were wondering whether you had any gray hair, <laughs> StreamYard is telling you right now. <laughs> Folks, support the show because Graham needs some just for men hair coloring to <laughs> be able so my head doesn't disappear on the wall. <laughs> That was my problem was I used to do the blurry background thing. And whenever, because I had the black hair and the blackness behind, it was just all, I'd always have half my head missing. And yeah. I don't know because like a gray background is so boring if I take it away. But what if you, you could paint the wall bright green. I could put a green screen behind me. I could do that. I do have a, a curtain. I could just put up a curtain rod right there and hang it. I might do that. We'll see if that's But better. is there not another, is there not plans for another plasma screen? I don't want to get another screen. I just feel like I, I not, gotten, not feeling it. I've gotten a couple of those and this is a, this where I'm at is very temporary right now. So um, when, when really, it stops working, you can use it to surf on, right? The plasma screen. Yeah. That's I'm actually building a houseboat out of plasma screens um, <laughs> and and old leaf parts. Oh yeah, my leaf is oh that's all right. I put pontoons under the leaf that got smashed, and I'm just living on a houseboat. Um, yeah. it's like some private detective from a '70s show, and that's what I'm doing. So, uh, <laughs> we're calling it boat boat detective. Um, I like it. 
I like it. It's actually me and another private. The name of the show is We're Both Private Detectives, so it's called Boat Dicks. <laughs> it, it's it's got a it's got a small but devoted audience of people who mainly just show up for the title. On another episode of Boat Dicks, Graham and Chester take down the mob or whatever. <laughs> yeah, he's absolutely named Chester. Yeah, he's got to be. But I call on the show. I call him Chet. Like Chet, we got to roll. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then I fire up my Leaf houseboat and we put boat paddle dicks. It down. Boat dicks. Yeah, I can bam, see bam, it. Bam, 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 bam. Boat dicks <laughs> solving crimes in Marina del Rey. Ba, ba, ba. Like it's not a lot of big crime in the marina. Amazing. Um, folks, we have a fantastic show for you. In addition to another exciting episode of Boat Dicks, we're going to talk about. <laughs> Lee's on a on a fake science kick, so we're going through all of the fake science. And Is that, um, you're, you're not a fan of the fake science kick. I've no, been, I love I've it. I've been enjoying I, it. I, I love it. I just I just love how one of us will get on a kick of some subject. Like my, lately, and today is, is the first day. I mean, I got on the lost kick. That's always fun when one of us just finds something and we realize, oh, there's way more to this than we thought. Like this. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I call it a series so that I don't sound as Looney Tunes, but kick, kick works as well. A fetish. He's on a fake science fetish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, our our producer just said, "Call it Dick on a boat and have the lo lonely island guys do some do the theme song." That's that's what. It works. That's true. Dick on a boat. Yep. It's just a dick on a boat. Um, so we're we're workshopping the, the title. Did my did I just free up? You you have oh. frozen on my end. This keeps happening. This camera is making my head bleed. I can't. Oh. And you you haven't found the source of the problem yet. Nope. I unplugged the camera. No, I unplugged this. There's one thing we know about Graham. He and technology get along like gangbusters, like boat dicks, really. Like two boat dicks. Oh, God, I hate this thing. I hate it. I just hate it. <laughs> this keep. This is what keep happening. I don't know. It's like a stream yard of you. I don't know. <laughs> See? See? Oh, my God. It's ceiling fan cam. Fan cam. Now we've got fan cam. <laughs> we missed master's cam, but now we got ceiling fan cam. Well, Mattress Cam got an agent, is asking for way too much money, so we just couldn't. <laughs> Mattress Cam got a uh, got a three-picture deal with the sleep store. So we, um, <laughs> now I've got, and by the way, that on, where is that? The, the edge of the fan, that's dust. That's why that's really dark. The dirty blades. Nice. nice. So you turn that on and you just get a mouthful. Yeah, it's just. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, the, the boat deck solved that for me. That's why. <laughs> there, there's nothing I love more than when you get turned into just that emoji of the little person because your camera has shut off and it's pure fury coming out of that, but it's pulsing like it's kind of happy. It's like motherfucker, and it's this little emoji of a guy. It's just it is pulsing because I'm happy. It's this <laughs> such pure joy. I don't and now the background's gone. I don't know what happened with that. Oh, this like literally I got lucky yesterday, or no, Tuesday I interviewed Chris Hedges and the camera worked for the first, like literally. Thank God it stopped working right as the interview was over. And I was like, well, let's wrap up the interview, Chris. Thank you for being on my show now that the camera just shit the bed. So let's just. Now but... that you're seeing I'm a man under a ceiling fan, <laughs> I'll, I'll wrap it up. Whether than my distorted head floating in the clouds. Um, now I'm, I keep looking at the wrong place now. I got to remember to look here. All right. Let's see if we can crop out the ceiling. There, there is probably some tech whiz who knows what's happening somewhere. Yeah, Skynet is taking over. Um, <laughs> that's that's what's going on. Or this is clearly done by the CIA or the NSA or whatever private intelligence firm. Um, so, all right, Lee, let's do our first. <laughs> Speaking of. <laughs> 
Um, Which one are we starting with? Well, since I just invoked the private intelligence, let's talk about the uh, the National Security Act of 1947 in our first segment of Government Secrets, <laughs> live from FanCam. So <laughs> this is the National Security Act of 1947. And why I wanted to talk about this is because you and I have basically referenced this date, 1947, without actually giving the history and background. So, and we've talked about this before. So 1947 is really when the CIA was formed. Uh, what was formerly- Truman, Yeah, Truman signed it in. Yes. And it was part of this National Security Act of 1947. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So um, for those of you who don't know, we've, you know, we've mentioned this many times before, just to give you a quick sort of historical background, the OSS was the covert or spy department of the United States during World War II. And so in 1947, they created the National Security Act. And I'll go into all the details of that. And out of the National Security Act, the CIA was born. And that's really when America started really becoming amazing. Um, and so that's when we made America great again. Yes. Dare I say this National Security Act of 1947 is the first time Eisenhower went, I think this might have bad long term effects. So. The National Security Act was born out of, or the excuse was made, or argument was made. Whether this is accurate or not, it's debatable. And even if this reason was a valid reason, what has since become of the National Security Act, obviously we cover on this show almost on a weekly basis, <laughs> the, the, the ramifications right. of it. So what it said was, um, the argument was made, and I'll get into it, because it says, again, this is on Wikipedia, so it's, we always say, we're not like huge fans of Wikipedia, but if it's on Wikipedia, then God only knows what really is, is, is being. But what was right. the claim that was made? Oh, now you it was um, had we had FDR had more of a unified military. Uh, Pearl Harbor would have been prevented. That was a big conversation. Like, how could we, how did Pearl Harbor happen? How did we let this happen? How could this, how could this be prevent, prevented in the future? Right. So um, the National Security Act, uh, which was enacted July 26, 1947, was a law enacting major restructuring of the United States government's military and intelligence agencies following World War II. The majority of the provisions of the act took effect on September 18th, 1947, the day after the Senate confirmed James Forrestal as the first Secretary of Defense. What this did, the act merged the Department of the Army, renamed during World War II, it was called the Department of War. The department, so it merged the Department of the Navy, the Department of the Army, and the newly established Department of the Air Force, DAF, into the National Military Establishment, the NME. The act also created the position of the Secretary of Defense as the head of the NME. It established the United States Air Force under the DAF, which worked to separate Army Air Forces into its own service. It also protected the Marine Corps as an independent service under the Department of the Navy. Aside from the unification of these three military departments, the act established the National Security Council and the CIA, uh, the latter of which headed by the director of central intelligence. So uh, this legislation was, as you said, was the result of efforts by Harry Truman beginning in 1944. President Truman proposed the legislation to Congress on February 26, 1947. The bill was introduced into the House of Representatives on February 28th and the Senate March 3rd. Senator Jan Cherney was the bill sponsor, uh, Gurney, sorry. Senator Gurney was chairman of the Senate Committee on Armed Services, led committee hearings for the bill from mid-March to early May. The bill passed in the Senate on July 9 and the House on July 19th. The Senate agreed to a related House resolution the bill received, Lee, do you think it was, uh, take a guess, partisan support? Like they fought about it or it was bipartisan support? What do you think? What do you think? I'm going to go high fives and circle jerks all the way around. 
<laughs> I don't know how you figure that out, Lee. You <laughs> are a clairvoyant. Yes. Shockingly, bipartisan support. Um, and circle jerks and high fives all around. Um, the act was signed by President Truman on July 26 aboard the presidential aircraft Sacred Cow. See, so um, uh, if you're going to sign the CIA into existence, do it on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> yeah. The presidential aircraft called the Sacred Cow. Oh, That's aircraft. the name of the presidential uh, aircraft. The Sacred Cow. This is before it was called Air Force One. Sacred Cow seems a little funny to me, but why, um, why did they change that name? I thought they I thought they had it right. Yeah. Ladies and because that wouldn't make for good Hollywood movies. Sacred cow down or whatever. <laughs> Bent sacred cow. <laughs> <laughs> Broken cow utter. <laughs> utter disaster. Oh, Lee Camp. Holy shit. You just wrote the sequel. Um, <laughs> Utter disaster, utter disaster. Just when you thought it couldn't get worse <laughs> this summer. <laughs> Just when you uh, thought Sacred Cow was dead. <laughs> you run into utter disaster. <laughs> <laughs> yes, letters exploding and then Chuck Norris in his prime. Oh, yes. Just an AI Chuck Norris fighting it. <laughs> with Pharrell Williams singing a song while fighting with him or something. I don't know, whoever, you know. Um, so uh, before World War II, the uh, congressional, this is the, <laughs> this is the one thing that I think they forgot to mention when they were explaining to the American people about the National Security Act was what kind of the real intention was. So I'm gonna tell you what it was like before the National Security Act and you tell me, <laughs> what they really wanted to do. Before World War II, congressional committees oversaw the cabinet level War Department and Navy Department. And while each department was separate from the other, both were able to obtain aircraft. During this time, the president had a level of authority over the departments. After the attack of the harbor, Congress passed the first War Powers Act, which authorized the sitting president to make such redistribution of functions among executive agencies as he made necessary, provided that it is only in matters relating to the conduct of the present war that these authorities will expire six months after the termination of the war. So again, it was sort of a consolidation of power and, and getting rid of any sort of uh, oversight. <laughs> yeah, but it was the do away with oversight act. The, the can't we just commit uh, awful crimes without everybody watching us? Can we just yeah. uh, we don't we don't all these eyeballs on us? We just here is the thing, folks, and we didn't want to say this, but the intelligence agencies very shy, just very shy folks. They don't like a lot of people watching them and interacting. So if we could do can away just, with any of that, yeah, I just I just kind of feel like can we just pillage the American taxpayers resources for our own uh, greedy profit while the infrastructure crumbles without everybody getting their panties in a twist. Can we just do that? That I think is pretty much, that's the, the long version of this bill. Can we just uh, kill all of the leaders that uh, called for equality or cooperation with other nations and not have people ask questions? You got it. The Kennedys are dead. Outstanding. That's part of the bill. We just took, we took, out, wiped those guys out. We got rid of Wallace. We got rid of, um, who was it? McGovern. McGovern was a big anti-war guy that they made sure. Uh, uh, MLK. Yep. MLK. All of them. Um, the, uh, it was during World War II, the chief of staff of the army, George Marshall, brought the idea of unification of the U.S. Uh, armed services to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but he was routinely rebuffed on the grounds that a substantive discussion of this option while the country was in war might undermine the war effort. On August 26, 1944, future President Harry Truman, who was senator at the time, wrote that under such a setup of unification, another Pearl Harbor will not have to be feared. 
In the article, Our Armed Forces Must Be United, Military Problems Apparent During World War II that turned attention to the need for unification were a lack of preparedness, a lack of attention to logistics in war, and a lack of coordination among services. In the years following the war, President Truman had been pushing the unification of the armed services until the passing of the National Security Act in 1947. Having research conducted on the topic since 1944 and having expressed his desire for Congress to act on the issue as early as 1946, uh, he stated in a letter to Congress on June 1946 that he considered vital to have unified forces of our national defense. Uh, and President Truman obviously made that happen. Uh, so also sent a bill proposal to Congress detailing the creation uh, this is in February of 1947, of a national defense establishment. And Representative Claire E. Hoffman introduced the bill to the House of Representatives on February 28, 47. It was then referred to as the Committee on Expenditures in the Executive Department. So that is, Lee, a fancy way to say, uh, we got to get endless budgets for all this war stuff. That's what we're really going to need. Um, and so there was a bunch of hearings on this. The, uh, of course, there were some debates, uh, but it grew uh, strong bipartisan support. And the, uh, the coordination for national security, uh, they worked to establish a national security council and advisory council to the president for matters relating to national security in the realm of domestic, foreign, and military policies and the intent of allowing the military departments to communicate more efficiently. It also established the CIA. Under the National Security Council, led by Director of Central Intelligence, the role of Director of Central Intelligence and the CIA as a whole is as an advisory unit to the National Security Council and as a coordinator of intelligence. So they, again, this is- a, just advising. That's only- we're just advisors. That's all. That's all we did in Vietnam. We sent we, advisors. We, so, it, see this wristwatch that uh, fires uh, bear mace out of it. That's just advisory, standard issue. That's when you read this, knowing the you know poison, what, the poison dart that comes out of my shoe when I tap the heel. It's just, it's just an advisory poison dart. That's all it is. We were just in an advisory capacity to overthrow Mozadik and, you know, a dozen other democratically elected leaders. That didn't want to... and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when you read this, knowing what we know, what you and I have studied our, on our own, in our own separate, separate shows, and then doing this show for the last two years, you really see, Oh, this is how they took power out of the president's hand and put into the hands of the military and specifically the intelligence apparatus. So then these these this intelligence community didn't answer to the president. The president answered to them, in essence, what this is. We're yeah. advising you. So if you don't really know what we're doing, we're just going to present you. And this is sort of a tactic of they present like two or three options knowing they want them to do option, let's say, A. So they make options B and C look really shitty. And then it's like option A is the best one. And that's like, we've done extensive research and none yeah, of them talk about keeping someone in a little window of allowable options. They only give them three options and they're all in the, you know, let's do a horrible shit range. Uh, I know, I know that notoriously the joint joint chiefs went to Trump with uh, three options of what to do about Iran and the assassinate their top general was the one they put on the list to be like, OK, well, he's not going to do the crazy one. So we'll we'll put that one on the edge. But really, we want to push him towards this middle one. And instead, Trump was like, yeah, assassinate their general. Sounds great. Let's do it. I love it. I'm all on board. It's like, um, I don't know, a couple months ago, Kim.com just posted this on um, Twitter. And I and I talked about it last night in my live stream. How about uh Biden said, you know, last year at some point, if we send weaponry to Ukraine, that is in essence getting involved and that gets us into World War III. And then yesterday he's like, we're sending tanks to Ukraine. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. it, this is, and I'm sure Biden, who 
I doubt also even blowing up people. Russia's multi-billion dollar pipeline. I feel like once you've crossed that bridge. Yeah, it's and, you know, reading this National Security Act and what it really was about, you see how that that's how they got this. That's how they planted the seeds. This is how they got rid of Kennedy. This is how they got rid of McGovern. This is like got rid of, I mean, like all well, of the, well, this is, and it's also why they got rid of Kennedy. Why? Uh, yeah. One of the main reasons is he was going to break up the CIA. We talk, have talked a lot about that, but we also have covered uh, at least once uh, that Truman in, so it was published in the Washington post a month after, and you can still find it online, but a month after Kennedy was killed, Truman wrote an op-ed and it said that the CIA uh, had essentially gone rogue. He didn't use those words, but gone way outside of what he imagined they would be used for. This is the guy who signed them into creation, uh, saying that you know they were getting it was getting very dangerous, and that the CIA has has gone way past its purview and those kind of things. So it was in the paper a month after, but he wrote the handwritten version like a week after JFK was killed. So do you think Truman might have thought there was some connection between JFK being murdered and the CIA? Yeah. I mean, and it's, you see too, part of what, part of what this is too is, and this is why they had to get rid of JFK was they wanted the endless budget. And we know this now, I was even talking about it with hedges yesterday. They have black budgets. The intelligence community has budgets yeah. that nobody knows about. So when everybody gives the 900 billion number as the amount we spend on military, if you count the black budget, it's way above a trillion. Some people think it may be as high as 1.6 trillion a year. Yeah, that I wouldn't. The, at the very least, they're getting a good three, four hundred billion dollars. The intelligence community that's off the books. It's probably more like 500 billion to a trillion or more, like you say. I mean, it's it's. It's and already our budget, our eight hundred and fifty eight billion dollar more budget is already offensive. And then that's on top of the hundred and twenty billion we've already sent to Ukraine, which is coming out of another budget, like the State Department's budget or something crazy like like it's it, right. It's like it's like the budget for lifeguards at the congressional pool yeah. is secretly being used to fund Ukraine. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. It's like, hey, guys, we got to tighten our everybody's got to wear floaties now at the congressional pool. So because we <laughs> the, uh, the lifeguards can't work overtime or whatever, you know what I mean? Like. So um, this the coordination was uh, the role of the director of the central intelligence of the CIA as a whole is an advisory unit to the National Security Council and as a coordinator of intelligence. So it's really how it was, the CIA was basically set up to handle everything. Finally, um, Title I worked to establish the National Security Resources Board. This is what we're talking about in terms of black budgets, an advisory board of the president on matters relating to the coordination of military, industrial, and civil, civilian mobilization. So this is probably, would be my guess, is to the seeds that were planted to get us where we are today, which is not only do we have the NSA and the CIA, we have all of this private intelligence companies that are getting funded to spy on civilians. I mean, we know it's probably private intelligence that, well, we know this for a fact because the documents have been leaked that infiltrate all of the movements, Occupy Black Lives Matters, the right-wing movements, Proud Boys, you know, so it's a lot of times the FBI in coordination with private intelligence, the surveilling of American citizens is done by a lot of private intelligence. So it's outsourced and there's something in the neighborhood. I remember right, and they I always have names like, uh, like, uh, you know, with black water and tiger swan. It's, it's, it's like you take the name of your dog and add it to the name of your favorite stuffed animal when you were a kid. And that's your mercenary name or something like, it's the most bizarre fucking like tiger yeah. swan and it's a bunch of ex Marines who are getting paid to beat up protesters. Yeah. And, and then you've got like J trig, which is another private intelligence company. And they usually do a lot of um, online stuff. Like they're usually the ones that when I talk about Assange on this show, come in the chat and start going nuts, you know, and uh, 
And I usually say, hey, what's up, J-Trig? How you guys doing? So <laughs> J-Trig. That's like, and it also, that's also great. The national military establishment, as we talked about, uh, and that basically coordinated the Department of Ar Army, the Department of Navy, and the Department of Air Force. Um, and this is basically what it is and established the war council as advisory council to secretary of defense. So it's just like more war, more war, more war, and more money for war. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, oh, and they changed the presidential, they amended in July 18 of 1947 was the presidential succession act to remove the secretary of Navy and replace the secretary of war with secretary of defense. So, what what number in line is the Secretary of Defense? I think the Secretary of Defense is, I'll check this right now, is uh, fourth, I think. So it's Vice President, Secret uh, Speaker of the House. Um, it is declaring, I think they're fourth. Well, whatever it is, it's terrifying because they have all the guns. <laughs> yeah they, they have all the they have all the real guns they have a, every every american's got a gun but th those aren't real guns. those aren't the those aren't the pentagon guns yeah it's uh <laughs> it's not the Pentagon. let me see it's um speaker of the house uh president pro tempore of the senate then a veteran janitor at congress named gary <laughs> and then Secretary of Defense. And then a Marine Corps drill sergeant. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then it's Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury. And then now in 47, it was Secretary of War is replaced with Secretary of Defense. And so then he's, the, he's like five or six or something. Yeah. Secretary of Defense is, well, VP five. Yeah. So he's fifth after VP. So sixth in line. Secretary of Defense. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I mean, no. not that it matters. I mean, the, the, the people at the top are also garbage human beings. So. Yeah. But the postmaster general was one of them for a while. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that if like third in line postmaster general becomes president. That would he would make. I don't know who the fuck it is, but I'm sure he's a better president than what we got now. <laughs> I would trust the postmaster general over any of these other psychos that are stacked up to take over this, this position. So, um, yeah, that's government secret. Number one, the national security act of 1947, making America better and more America. And more America. <laughs> All right. Now let's get into series segment number like three or four on forensic science being utter pieces of shit. Lee has just blown up any of my, like, I like those forensic shows. Like I used to love watching CSI, like, and even the reality ones, I used to love watching those shows. Now Lee has just crushed those for me. Really? So, you, you did not admit this earlier in the series. You've been hiding this fact. I, cause I was so bummed. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> Like, I just, my, my watching too many cop shows youth still has me in the like, let's, let's be detectives and catch the bad guy. Now you're just like, nah, it's all nonsense. They just, <laughs> I mean, according to CSI, you just take a, a photo of a, a guy's teeth as he runs down the street and you'll know whether he murdered someone. And then you just go to a computer and it type fast yeah. and then, oh, it comes you, up you and then plug it into the computer and then beep, 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 boop, boop, beep, beep. <laughs> and then there's a shot of the ceiling fan cam and then they give you the result. <laughs> beep, boop, boop, boop. Guilty. <laughs> beep, boop, boop, boop. <laughs> and then it spits out who the murderer is every time. Every time. <laughs> but... So for, for those of you who missed earlier parts of the series, I hope you go back and check it out because we're slowly breaking down each different area of forensic science and how it's utter horseshit. And the reason this fits under our, our mission statement of government secrets is because this is what governments, state and federal, have used for 
you know, decades, uh, if not hundreds of years, but decades at least, to to uh, protect the status quo, to arrest essentially whoever they wanted, to pretend they had the the answer to every crime that's committed, and to win every uh, every time they were in a court uh, defending their evidence to lock someone away for fucking ever. So. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> right on, dude. Love it. <laughs> don't don't worry. You can still like iced tea from SVU or whatever. Iced tea from SVU. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's why I tuned in. It was iced tea going, yo, yo, we got the bad guy. And then credits. So all right, this, this is coming from a uscourts.gov uh, document and or article. And so they go into a little bit of various individuals who have been locked away for life or for many years uh, for arsons that they didn't commit. Um, and so I'm not going to get into most of those details, but... I, I just wanted to put this first part in there that they say since 1989, 31 people have officially been exonerated that were locked up for arsons, uh, at least in part on the basis of new evidence that they did not commit the arson, according to the National Registry of Exonerations. But that is not all inclusive. It doesn't list the names of people like Lewis Taylor, freed in 2013 after serving 42 years of a life sentence for a 1970 fire in Arizona in a hotel that killed 29 people or James Hugney set free earlier this year after serving nearly 36 years of a life sentence for a 1978 house fire that killed his 16 year old son. <sighs> I also want to add, it doesn't include uh, Cameron Todd Willingham who was executed in Texas in 2004 for supposedly setting a fire that killed his three daughters and he didn't do it, and it was an electrical fire. So not only did he have to witness the death of his three daughters, but then the state executed him as well. Uh, and this is the type of bullshit that, that goes on. But it's an interesting story. For decades, fire investigators relied on a set of beliefs and assumptions akin to folklore about what were thought to be the telltale signs of arson that were passed down from one generation to the next and accepted at face value. You know, kind of like uh, old stories about how your uncle once diddled a sheep, like that kind of thing. Uh, it's just passed down like good old family stories. <laughs> you remember when old great, great, great uncle Jerob stole that cow? <laughs> well, he also created an accelerant that tied him to an arson. <laughs> so literally this stuff is like passed down from one fire investigator to another. Most investigators whose job was to quote unquote catch arsonists were former police officers or firefighters with little or no scientific background or training. Boy, where have we heard that before? Maybe on the bite marks uh, people that were just old dentists that wanted to sound special. So now we've got <laughs> now we've got former police officers who, you know, wanted say, saying I'm an ex cop wasn't uh, helping them lay enough pipe. So they had to claim to be fucking arson scientists so that they could get laid. And uh, and here we are. <laughs> So let me see if I understand your theory correctly. These are just cops looking for shit to get pick up chicks in bars and go, yeah, I'm an arson specialist. And then just back to my room, zip, boom. Did you call this a theory? This is fact. <laughs> <laughs> Lee's laying pipe fact. is, is... <laughs> I like it. Absolutely. They, they wanted to feel special, so they called themselves arson scientists, even though there was no schooling involved. There was no, like, they, they didn't even have a, for a long time, they didn't even have a book that said, here's how to, how, to, how to know it's arson. They learned on the job by watching experienced investigators, experienced in bullshit. Like, yeah, you, wow, he's been on the job 52 years, and he's nailed 
35 arsonists, uh, all based on bullshit. But still, that's a lot of experience. He has a wealth of bullshit experience that this fire department needs. He's the cornerstone of our bullshit department. <laughs> so they learned on the job by watching experienced investigators who learn the trade from their superiors, perpetuating a belief structure that still influences some practitioners today. So some of this shit continues to go on. So this is mind numbing. This is the stuff that drives me nuts is like, okay, then this is getting uncovered. You're, you're reading an article. So wouldn't somebody at some fire department somewhere in America go, all right, we're starting a whole new arson research facility. We're going to really test this. Out. We're going to see what can we trace this? Can we, are there things that materials that are left behind so we can, let's get this right. And some country somewhere has to be doing this the right way. There's because you, you would assume, I, I mean, I think that most countries honestly would say that they just don't know if something was arson or not. And so they don't lock up the person. Uh, now that's wow. not every country, but I think a lot of them are like, well, it, it seems like it could have been, but we don't have any proof. So we're not going to ruin someone's life who might be innocent. Now in the U.S., we're like, here's the plan. We'll ruin this guy's life, might be innocent, doesn't matter. <laughs> Just get the, it's the thing we've talked about before in this series and in other things of part of the problem with our overall, not just policing, but legal system is the quota thing. You got to lock somebody up. You, you got to find, get the bad guy. So police departments then, and in this case, arson investigators are probably under pressure, not excusing those are, that are knowingly lying or whatever, but I'm sure some of them are under pressure, like get me a conviction, get me someone locked up so we can say in the press, we got the bad guy in America going back to watching the Super Bowl. And just that's part right. of the, the system the, that the creates pro, The prosecutors are under that kind of pressure. Then the, fi the fire investigators, I mean, sorry, the fire the arson scientists or whatever that are brought in to testify, they're often paid for their testimony. So uh, they get, they often get money, but even if they don't get money, they're, they, they, they've staked the reputation on this. They get cachet. They get to lay pipe. They get uh, various, various perks of being this famed in arson scientist who is telling the jurors how it is. So, Look, yeah. sweetie, I'd love to spend the night, but uh, I got a big court case tomorrow and they're paying me to just talk some arson sets. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I'll see you next weekend. But this was a lovely evening we had. And he just wee, 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 drives off in his fire marshal car or whatever. So at the time, so so back in the up up until late 80s, early 90s, the investigation of fire was viewed more as an art than a science. A mix of born, a mix born of experience and intuition. So a bit of, a bit of both, you know. Yeah, a little bit of uh, I've had bullshit passed down to me, so I know how to make up this bullshit. And a little bit's just like I feel it in my heart. This guy probably burned his three kids alive. Well, that's good old cop show. Look, I got a gut feeling on this one. That's our guy, you know. And it's like, well, yeah. good enough for me. Like, yep. Got a gut, gut feeling is really what it comes down to. Uh, fire debris was red like tea leaves. And investigators routinely interpreted the artifacts of a fire, burn patterns, charred wood, melted metal, collapsed furniture springs, spalled, which is a word meaning chipped or scaled concrete, and crazed glass, which means numerous random cracks in the glass. They viewed all of those things as surefire, excuse the pun, indicators of arson. Uh, and speaking of the gut feeling, I don't remember much about this movie, but the perhaps one of the one of the few movies about arson, probably uh, Backdraft, the movie Backdraft. I remember them like walking through, and one of them, I remember, there were several scenes where it was like you have to feel the fire. And what it, it, it's a monster that you just, you just have to know it and feel it in you. And it's like, okay, but that doesn't prove anything. <laughs> oh yeah. That was Robert De Niro. He was the main, he was like the, he was exactly what you're describing. He was depicted in the movie as this like old sage mystic, this fire mystic. Right. <laughs> like a, like a native American searching for water in the desert or something. 
<laughs> right. He just goes in there and how are you going to know if it's arson? Well, I'm going to do tarot card readings and this is going <laughs> to tell us. I'm going to, I'm going to lick the burnt wood and then I can taste the arson flavor. <laughs> yeah. He just goes and sees the thing. And just goes, <laughs> this was arson. <laughs> it's just a scene of De Niro licking the walls. <laughs> You talking to me? You talking to me? I don't know who you talking to? I mean, you you lick charcoal, you do get that De Niro frown. Nah, you insulted him a little bit. You insulted him a little bit. And this so, was our thing. So some of those myths that were passed down were based on what seemed like intuitively Ah, quote unquote, obvious deductions, such as the notion that gas burns hotter than wood would burn. So therefore, if something burned hotter, it was probably burned by gas, which means someone probably lit it. Others were the result of unwarranted generalizations, like observing a pattern of spalling around the remains of a gasoline container and making an erroneous association between the spalling and the gasoline. Uh, and by the way, by the way, one of the things they that they used to convict Cameron Todd Willingham and ultimately execute him uh, was that they found accelerant at the front patio. It was like an RV type mobile home. They found accelerant in the, by the door of the uh, now later it was revealed. And apparently this did not stop him from being executed. It was revealed that that was where they stored their like gasoline for their char for their, uh, right. for their barbecue. Their, but, their, and, their flame, their flame, whatever flame stuff, fluid, lighter fluid for their barbecue. So that's why it was. That's why it was there. But I just wanted to add. I'm pretty sure this was the plot line of Meet the Fockers. <laughs> that sounds right. No. Since De Niro's always playing some sort of arson guy in every movie he does. The, yeah. They they could tell by the uh, spalling across Ben Stiller's face that. Uh, <laughs> De Niro had set the fire. Uh, so let's see. But none of those so-called arson indicators were grounded in, Graham, wait for it, science. Oh. Yay. Why do we need science when we're convicting people and ruining lives? Why do we need it? Uh, and by the way, I haven't even, and neither does this article mention that, yes, we're talking about the people locked away for life and the people executed because of bullshit arson science. But it was also, it's also been used through the years to deny God knows how many insurance claims so that people lost their houses and are paid nothing uh, to try and recover from that. So there's that as well. G. And I wonder how much of the insurance industry has helped. Um, keep this uh, fake science going so that they don't have to pay out insurance claims. They played no role, Graham. They just want the no, truth. None. It's they not about money. America is not they, about money. Listen, they're just like iced tea. They just want the truth. <laughs> iced tea and Belzer. <laughs> By the way, you know, Belzer put out a, several years ago, put out a book on all the, like the assassination of JFK and MLK and like all these conspiracy theories. Richard Belzer did that? Yeah. That not really theories that are true. <laughs> Good for him. Yeah. So uh, uh, in 1977, the now defunct law enforcement assistance administration, doesn't that sound like a lovely place to work? That literally, so, again, it sounds like one of those, it's so obviously corrupt, like the Italian American Businessmen's Association, like this is just a private social club, uh, you know. <laughs> and, you know, law enforcement really wants a lot of assistance if it doesn't agree with everything law enforcement already says. Oh, and it, they love outside. They, they love to be told they're wrong. Yes, they love civilian oversight. They love, absolutely. And, they, and when they are wrong, they promptly admit it, always immediately. They just want to get it right. So the now defunct Law Enforcement Assistance uh, Administration sought to collect arson expertise through a survey of fire investigators, but the effort may have done more harm than good. The results were published in a booklet that presented many of the myths uh, of that era as fact. So basically, 
They collected all of this bullshit into a big bucket of bullshit. And then they handed that bucket or copies of that bucket out to others so that they could stick their head in the bullshit. That's what they were doing. <laughs> Three years late. Can you tell I'm not a fan? <laughs> and the thing is, since you've done three of these in a row now, it's really like your rage at all of this fa it's bullshit is really, <laughs> I'm really seeing it come across hard. It's, it's adding up. It's adding up. It's bullshit on bullshit on bullshit. <laughs> three years later, the National Bureau of Standards published the Fire Investigator's Handbook, which repeated the myths published by the LEAA. Those myths, in turn, were cited and repeated in many other textbooks, uh, further entrenching the errant bullshit accepted in the fire investigation community. Uh, that was all a quote, except I changed one word to bullshit, uh, as opposed to myths. <laughs> okay, that's acceptable, Lee. I think we can handle that. <laughs> so... What it began to change in the mid 1980s when some members of the fire investigation community began to question the scientific basis for many of the prevailing myths. So apparently there was a small group of young guns who were like, hey, is any of this based in fact? And the veterans were like, no, you just got to feel it. You just got to lick the walls and, you know, and. The, these other Shut up, guys, kid. <laughs> these other guys were like, should we test any of these hypotheses? No, just keep licking. Oh, you punk kids with your testing and your scientific method. I'm tired of it. Just go out there and rub up against a burnt wall and then feel it. Let it know. Did you get a boner? It was arson. You, if you, if you get hard when you're pressed against the melted couch remnants then you know it was arson. You, you know. know. Something is wrong. Nothing makes you hard other than crime. <laughs> and in 1985, in an effort to address those concerns, the National Fire Protection Association, a group dedicated to fire safety and prevention, gathered a committee of experts from the scientific and fire investigation communities to develop guidelines for conducting fire and explosion investigations. I love that it wasn't until the late 1980s that they... We're even like, maybe we should uh, come up with some guidelines. Kind of feel like, I kind of feel like maybe we should uh, not just let the tea leaves determine who's going to jail or not. I don't know. Like, maybe it's just me. Maybe we should have something more than just that guy licking the wall over there. No. <laughs> the result was a document called NFPA 921 that sent shockwaves through the fire investigation community. It was titled Guide for Fire and Explosion Investigations and was first published in 1992. It is now considered the Fire Investigator's Bible. NFPA 921 not only dispelled many of the myths slash bullshit, but marked the beginning of a movement within the profession to, wait for it, apply scientific principles to fire investigation. Oh, these young hippies are so crazy with their stupid ideas and their science. I'm sick of it. It, I mean, it, it, I love that we pretend to be some sort of evolved species. We waited till the mid 90s to have any evidence that we were locking people away for life appropriately. It and it also feels like America is the most devolved of these human race of people in terms of because everything is so. Because just a selfish capitalist society, everything is ego driven, right? Because it's selfish is all me, 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 me. So it's not about, hey, let's get it right. It's like, well, I used to believe this, or I was, I was, I was a part of the old way. So if you're telling me the old way, we need to change it, then I'm going to take that personally because I'm a selfish American that thinks everything's all about me. And so I can't even sit there and go, well, what's for the greatest good? It's not an insult to me that we had it wrong in the old days. Let's just get it right for everybody. And it's a it's a position of weakness to never admit right. fault. It's a position of strength to go, I was 100% wrong. And America is weak and stupid. Anyway, so you were saying. <laughs> I mean, I will say, yeah, I think it's worse in America, but there are other fields where this kind of bullshit goes on. I remember hearing about the guy who came up with the theory of tectonic plates, like, because uh, whatever, 
area of science it is ge- uh, geologists i don't know uh that that we're saying that, you know these mountains aren't old enough to they're not the age of the earth or anything so why is it that we have fairly young mountain ranges and things like like what's going on and the guy who came up with the idea of tectonic plates was not he wasn't part of the old guard. He wasn't a geologist. And so they just completely ignored him and pretended that can't be it. He doesn't know uh, for years because unless you have the appropriate education in this class, you know, this school or that school or you're an old veteran, they just ignore you. And so this goes on in a lot of fields. But the difference is geologists weren't sentencing, sentencing people to death. <laughs> That yeah, that's the thing. If you're if you're wrong about a mountain, uh, nobody goes to jail. Uh, so that's that's okay. So uh, so as opposed to using a, a you know whatever the polar opposite of a divining rod is a fucking fire destruction rod, uh, they started applying science. Started looking into some scientific principles for arson. Uh, because before that it was all just like Mercury's in retrograde, so therefore the <laughs> The, the the killer is Steve. Oh, Steve please don't let new agey people. Please don't let new agey people get near our, our arson science. Please, please, I don't tell me a chakra crystal caused a goddamn fire, and it was that person's karmic payment or whatever. I don't want to hear it. I don't. I want real science. <laughs> The initial response, this will shock you as well, to NFPA 921 in the fire investigation community was overwhelmingly negative. No, they didn't. They didn't just go, hey, we were wrong. Let's get it right. It's about getting it right. Yeah, they they didn't just go, hey, I've been wrong for 60 years. Oh, interesting. This is quite an interesting read. No, it was more, how dare you question our bullshit that we're trying to smear in your face? Look, it's right here. Just let it smear it on your face. The human race is so stupid it's it's i think we're done you know what i mean don't you get that like i think we can't if we can't I mean, we, are, we are we are the arsonists of the planet right now so <laughs> uh no uh lee that's called freedom anyway um it's yeah it's we, we it's unreal like and this refusal you know when people say like you know, just let everybody live on their own and, and fig, you know, people's societies will get it right. Maybe, but human beings, once they, they could just get like, they well, will I will say, it. Yeah. I, I think, I think we're shit. We're shittier under capitalism. Like there was a time yes. when groups of people, groups of people actually worked together and helped each other that like no. that did exist. No, you're right. It, it, no, capitalism makes it worse. And capitalism fuels the thing that why America is so much worse. Because again, it goes to because capitalism, you have to, I got to be all about me. I got to make a bunch of money. And if I make money and you're poor, sorry, that's not my, pro, you know, that's not my problem. Like I don't, capitalism breeds everybody to think about themselves and not the greater good. So everything yeah. is me, 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 like we were talking about earlier. And, yeah. you, it's, and an so, incentive, it's an incentive structure. Yeah. That we're, that we're born into and people don't even understand people don't even realize that when you live your whole life in something it influences your every move your every motivation and anyway makes you a psychopath uh, that doesn't care about real arson science anyway you were saying <laughs> so as they put it here this is why this is why it was overwhelmingly negatively viewed by the fire investigation community uh, because if what the new document said was true, it meant that hundreds, if not thousands, of accidental fires had been wrongly determined to have been intentionally set. No investigator wanted to admit to the unspeakable possibility that he had caused an innocent person to be wrongly convicted or a family denied their li- life savings, meaning no insurance payout. Uh, there was another eye-opening experience in 1991. This is one of my favorite parts. When investigators got a rare opportunity to study the, study the after effects of a fire they knew was not arson, visiting the scene of a fast moving brush fire near Oakland, California, that destroyed 3000 houses and killed more than two dozen people. And I don't know why it was a rare opportunity. Like there's non arson fire events all the time, but apparently 91 was the first time that investigators were like, let's see what it looks like inside uh, a non-arson fire destroyed house. The investigator who examined 50 homes 
found several indicators traditionally attributed to arson in these non-arson homes, including melted bed springs, melted copper, and crazed glass, which, as I mentioned, is glass with just like crazy cracks all over the place. Um, and at the time, those things were commonly thought to be caused, uh, sorry, crazed glass was commonly thought to be caused by rapid heating through the use of accelerant. So if you walked into a house, saw that the glass was cracked in a crazy pattern, that meant fucking Steve did it. Uh, but basically, all of this had been done by a brush fire. And so this kind of blew their mind. <sighs> they were like, holy shit. And one of them, uh, a fire scientist named or, or arson scientist named John Lentini, uh, who actually thought science should be a part of things. Conducted, Ugh, Lentini, God damn it. Conducted, conducted an experiment. Now, th this experiment is so complicated, Graham, that I know that you won't be able to really process it. And I'm not surprised it took them to the mid 90s to come up with such a such a high tech uh, just convoluted experiment. He took five panes of glass and heated them up in different ways and at various speeds. And Let me guess. Can I guess? Well, yes. Let me guess. He did this five different ways and they all had the crazy glass thing in them. You're getting close, but actually at first, none of them had the crazed glass. However, he then sprayed water on them, such as a firefighter might do, and they all got the crazed shatter pattern. Oh! Oh! <laughs> so basically, if a firefighter put out a fire, then you'd end up with crazed glass. Oh, good. So then did they start arresting firefighters for arson or what? For, what for fucking up the glass, yeah. <laughs> so oh to, wrap this, to wrap this up, one might think that the debate over arson science would have ended once nationally recognized standards were promulgated and courts began demanding reliable evidence. But such is not the case. Although the science exists to debunk these lingering fire investigation myths, the movie Backdraft is still out there, and this kind of junk science continues to enter courtrooms today through the testimony of some fire investigators who continue to ignore the science behind fire and rely on the art, quote unquote, of arson investigation. And may I remind everyone that Cameron Todd Willingham, innocent man, was executed in 2004, despite the fact this shit came out in 1992. Wow. Um, that. Uh... But you can go watch your CSI, Graham, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> that seems deliberately meanly. That seems like you're being deliberately meanly when you said that. That's what it felt like to me. <laughs> that was a triggering event, Lee. <laughs> oh, well, now I'll watch all those shows and just scream at the TV. Bullshit. You're lying. That guy's innocent. You know, like, oh, man. This, yeah. this show, it never ceases to amaze me. This show never ceases to amaze me <laughs> at what we discover. So, um it's, it's, uh, it's fucking insane. And I have at least of my forensic sciences garbage <laughs> the ongoing series. I've got at least one more, uh, maybe two, but we're not done yet. And for those who enjoyed this, go back, listen to the episode on lie detectors, the episode yes. on bite marks. <laughs> the bite mark one is up there with the crazy of, of the three you've done. I think bite mark is my favorite in terms of just the crazy junk science behind it. Although yeah. firefighters, you know, water being sprayed, causing the crazed glass thing, that's a close second um, in terms of just insane, no science, but people go to jail anyway thing. So that's amazing <laughs> to me. <laughs> this is... Someone just wrote, Graham's jaw has hit the floor so many times, he needs a new floor. <laughs> 
Yeah, I just need a, I just need like a cushion under this so that uh, every time I draw, it just doesn't hurt as much. Um, yeah, it's uh, it shows really good for crushing any of my fire, right? Like um, childhood, like. I used to love watching emergency like squad 51. I watched firefighter shows. I thought about becoming a fire. Not this is, this isn't, this isn't this, what we're saying isn't bad about firefighters. We appreciate firefighters, but oh, like, I'm, I'm all for putting out fires. I'm all, I'm in favor. We are pro extinguishing fires. I'm, let's just be real clear. Herman secrets is in favor. We don't want them spreading. Um, but I used to so buy into all the CSI forensic stuff and the, and the arson stuff. Um, but guess not. So I have fire extinguishers in all my, in my house, in my car, because I am a Red Cross disaster volunteer. So there is. Just remember not to spray water on your glass or they will arrest you. <laughs> and don't store gas on your front door. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, that sounds like government secrets episode 111. <laughs> Lee, where can people follow and find you? I know you're doing other shows and other good stuff. Yeah, uh, I got interviews out there. Uh, I got, I got, uh, you know, I've just recently talked to to Stella Assange and the the guys from Guerrilla History Podcast and uh, Richard Wolf and all these cool people. And that's at uh, youtubecom slash behind the headlines. But I have other stuff too. I have live streams and it's all, if you want everything at one place, it's leecamp.net. And I just want to remind people that we are headed over to patreon.com slash government secrets. We do an extra segment almost every week. And this week uh, we got some secrets about the department of Homeland security and, uh, and other I things. Oh, I bet you it's good secrets. Like, Oh, all their employees get organic Twinkies. I bet you that's what Homeland security you're going to tell us mainly but it's shoved up their ass as a punishment so it's yes. <laughs> as they're getting waterboarded that's what they get they get a, they call it twinkie boarding over at homeland security right. so and we're, we're gonna, gonna we're also gonna talk about shay's rebellion a little more Ooh, all right yeah folks so uh, patreon.com slash government secrets is a great way to support what we're doing you get all this bonus content uh and we very much appreciate it. you can get cool no we don't sell any government secrets merch except through Patreon. So if you want to get the logo on a t-shirt or a mug or a sticker, you can just sign up and you get it after three months. So we appreciate that. Go to uh, GrahamElwood.com and I'll be announcing tour dates. I'm just working on putting those together. My special drops March 2nd on the All Things Comedy uh, YouTube channel. So uh, be ready for that. And I'll be doing tour dates. So just go to GrahamElwood.com. And then uh, also I just did an interview with Chris Hedges which you can watch on my Patreon and on Rockfin, but I'll be dropping starting today uh, clips from that. There'll be three uh, different subjects we talk about. It's almost a, like a 50 minute interview. It's great. It's Hedges, man. It's my, my first time having him on the show. And he's just, you know, he's just a wealth of knowledge. And he has this new article out about how isolation is kind of crippling America. And it, so it's, it's uh, check that out. Just go to grandma.com. Cool, man. See you in a minute. All right, everybody. This has been Government Secrets, episode 111. Fake arson science and how the CIA got its legs in 1947. <laughs> All right, buddy. See you over there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for watching. I always keep thanking people on Rockfin, but I know we're not on Rockfin. We're on YouTube. Lee and I leave on my Facebook. So I'll take it off. I got to remember to not do Facebook and just to Rockfin. Anyway, thanks everybody. Thank you to our moderators and please go over to patreon.com slash government secrets right now. You can support the show and get bonus content for as little as five bucks a month. All right, everybody. Thank you.